world inside. The case for cooperation or confrontation between China and the U.S. Words from a Harvard professor on avoiding Thucydides trap. Is the U.S. or is the U.S.-Chinese relationship tending toward some version of what people are now calling Cold War II? And into the wild in China, the roads less taken than through the lens of a nature and wildlife photographer. To help inspire people to realize that, that these places need to be enjoyed and protected and preserved and valued. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Relations between China and the U.S. have been frosty for some time, but things have taken a turn for the worst this year as the result of COVID-19 pandemic. A new Cold War, the term has already been floating for some time among some. Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi warned this is a dangerous attempt to turn back the wheels of history. Could the two countries be indeed on the verge of a new Cold War? Earlier, I spoke with Professor Graham Allison from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He wrote the book, Destined for War, Can America and China Escape the Thucydides Trap, which tries to chart a course whether China and the U.S. can avoid a direct confrontation. Let's listen in. There has been a lot of talk, Professor, about the so-called Cold War. Is this really the Cold War? The Cold War, what was it? It was war, real war, by every means except uh, bombs and bullets, and ultimately came very close to real war multiple times, including the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we escaped. So Cold War, while it sounds, and it is better than hot war, is not good, that's mm -hmm. the first thing. Secondly, is the U.S. or is the U.S.-Chinese relationship tending toward some version of what people are now calling Cold War II? And I think the answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, the relationship in every dimension is becoming more uh, suspect and more hostile. On the other uh, what most people who think about, okay, especially Americans, a Cold War II is a good idea. They don't quite remember what was Cold War I. Yeah. There's several differences. So one huge difference between today and 1950, when we had Cold War I, was that China is not the Soviet Union. Mm. The Soviet Union was a totalitarian command and control economy that was not able to deal with technology. Uh, that's not China. China has managed this uh, magical version of a party-directed or party-led market economy that's very innovative, technologically very advanced. Secondly, uh, China is not a small part of the global economy. Mm -hmm. Indeed, China is the backbone of the global economy. So to try to persuade the Australians or the Germans or the Italians or the Singaporeans that they should side with the U.S. against China and decouple economically from China mm -hmm. is a fool's errand. Their economic relationship with China is so thick that if they were to decouple from China, they would have a depression in their own country. And if they had a depression, any government that chose that would be tossed out. So they're not going to do that. Mm. So that's, again, different than the First World War. Mm. So I think we'll start, unfortunately, though, as the relationship continues worsening on the current track, unless we come up with some new strategic rationale yeah. for the relationship between the U.S. and China, I think we're going to get a version of what will be called Cold War II, mm -hmm. but the differences, the differences, I think, will be bigger than the similarities. Professor, you earlier talked about uh, strategic rationale. I remember this phrase very well. Now, what exactly should it be? And given the circumstances, what exactly could it be? Historically, when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, most often the outcome is war. 
but uh, not war inevitable, not inevitable. Yes. So the challenge for all of us is to find a way to escape Thucydides' trap. It's a complicated idea, but it comes to, it merges two ideas. So John Kennedy, President Kennedy, in 1962, led the U.S. through the Cuban Missile Crisis. That was the most dangerous incident ever in history. Uh, he thought there was a one in three chance it would end in a nuclear war that would kill several hundred million people. So he came up with a proposed change, and ultimately it did become a big change in the American Cold War strategy, a world safe for diversity, by which he meant as diverse as a evil Soviet Union, because mm -hmm. he still thought the Soviet Union was an evil empire, and a good U.S. He still thought the U.S. was good. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, they were going to have to build a world safe for diversity as they competed peacefully. So that's the first piece. Secondly, there's, a, I think, a great uh, piece of, of ancient Chinese wisdom in the treaty that was uh, reached by the Song Dynasty mm -hmm. back in the year 1005 with the Liao, who were a northern Mongol tribe whom they couldn't defeat. And in the Chanyan Treaty of 1005, they agreed what historians call it to be rivalry partners. So the second idea is rivalry partners. And they would in some realm be fierce rivals, and in other realms, they would be thick partners. Mm. And that was very complicated to manage. But actually, the Chanyan Treaty provided for 120 years of peace mm. thereafter. Eventually, it broke down. So I think if we took these two ideas, both the U.S. and China will be rivals to who is the leader of 5G, who's the leader of AI, who's got the leading whatever, mm. for sure. Uh, but at the same time, partners, even thick partners, in other arenas, for example, trying to defeat coronavirus, there'll be no victory over coronavirus until there's a vaccine. And actually, there are a number of joint efforts between Americans and Chinese right. pursuing a vaccine. Yeah. So there are many areas in which U.S. and China have to be partners at the same time that we're rivals. So that's my currently the best sort of first approximation of a strategic rationale. Today, China is the world's second largest economy and the top trading partner of over 100 countries. Professor Graham Allison believes that those who seek a new Cold War fail to understand the reality. China is not the same as the former Soviet Union. They also fell short of appreciating the dynamics of China-U.S. relations, especially the balance against the backdrop of great historical changes. What anchored Sino-U.S. relations during great changes? Can the U.S. decouple other countries from the Chinese economy? Professor Allison has his answers. The military to military tie, it used to be one of the dangerous relationship uh, between the two countries, but now it become stabilizing factor, as some in the militaries would like to point out. That's an interesting thing because the two militaries are still having and maintaining their communication mechanism even at this very difficult time. So what would that mean? Does it provide us with some kinds of certainties to a certain degree? You used to work in the Pentagon as Assistant Secretary. Uh, so you know this better than most of us, Professor. Well, I think that uh, one thing to be said for both the Chinese and the American military is that they are very realistic. Mm. So they are not, uh, uh, they hear the rhetoric, mm -hmm. but they think about the reality. Yes. And in both countries, the military leadership has a good understanding of what war is and knows that war can kill thousands and tens of thousands yes. and hundreds of thousands, even millions of people. So every chairman of the JCS or a member of the JCS, mm -hmm. they think war means thousands of combatants killing each other and maybe killing millions of the 
other countries' citizens yeah. in something that is a disaster. Mm -hmm. So that's healthy. And when the Chinese and American militaries talk to each other, they're very realistic. On the other hand, I think as you've watched the competition between the U.S. and Chinese military continues. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, they have it since they talk to each other. And when they talk to each other, they generally talk pretty straight. Yeah. But uh, even that relationship has not developed as rapidly as one would wish or like. Mm -hmm. If I go back to your Cold War question, yeah. in the Soviet Union, uh, after, particularly after events like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the leaders concluded, we can't do that again. Mm -hmm. This was too dangerous. Right. There were so many ways things could go wrong. So they built levels and forms of communication, including military to military conversations mm -hmm. about what could go wrong. And I think we should have more of that. Yeah. Another thing I want to bring in is about uh, the business ties and also uh, global supply chains. Now, uh, we have heard a lot of rhetorics about how global supply chain would change and uh, resource chain would change. And uh, however, if you look at uh, some of the examples, uh, uh, particularly of huge American companies, such as Apple. Um, their global supply chains uh, from the start of the U.S.-China trade war, quote unquote, until today, it's not as much as what some people would like to see. Uh, of course, those people are minorities uh, of our two countries. I, I hope they will remain that way, but uh, still, uh, things are not changing in the way that some rhetorical speakers would like it to be. So, Professor, um, trade is another very concrete thing. What do you make of that branch that things are not like what the rhetorics have been talking about? Over the last uh, oh, like 25 years, mm. China has emerged as the primary workshop of the world the primary manufacturer mm -hmm. of everything, and the primary manufacturer of components for everything. So that's a great achievement of the Chinese economy over this period. And mostly uh, when, the, when the theory of the case was the U.S. and China would, quote, grow together, mm. that uh, globalization of the economy and the global integration of supply chains yeah. would uh, uh, create a bigger pie, as it does, and therefore more for everybody, and that that was ultimately good because the U.S. and China, uh, I think in the American story, were going, China was going to become more like the U.S. Mm. and more democratic mm -hmm. and therefore more peaceful. That... Uh, a picture, that storyline, is now judged across the entire American political class mm. to have been a, a cosmic bet that failed. Mm. So the rhetoric has uh, that object, that failed, and here we find ourselves, Americans, dependent upon China for many items that are not produced here in the U.S., and so many uh, senators are calling for with rhetoric, the U.S. should have its own supply chains mm -hmm. for virtually everything. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's the noise level. At the next level, the, both China and the U.S. have looked at the question of whether they should be dependent on the other for any key items in the supply chain mm -hmm. that are essential for their military or their security. And China has been over now more than a decade, working to reduce its dependency on the U.S. in areas of high technology. So that's Xi Jinping's 2025 and 2030 program in which China will become dominant in its domestic market in the 10 most advanced new technologies. And on the American side, uh, people are looking very carefully at the Commerce Department with their entity list or in the Justice Department in bringing suits against Chinese companies for intellectual property theft or for uh, uh, infringement on uh, you know, other. So that I think you're seeing uh, piece by piece 
some decoupling of some components of the supply chain. Mm. And this struggle is going on you know, right now, back and forth. And on the one hand, the rhetoric would suggest that there's been a grand decoupling. If you looked at the reality, it's a probably that's 5% of the picture. Mm -hmm. and 95% is still this very thick web that you described. And that thick web is what makes it possible for me to buy an Apple iPhone yeah. at the price that I do, as opposed to, you know, if I were having that produced only in the U.S., right. it probably would cost, you know, 50% more. Uh, so, uh, and I think on the Chinese side, China is working very hard to develop its own capacity to produce advanced semiconductors mm -hmm. because it worries very much that if the U.S. prevents the export of advanced semiconductors, uh, a company like Huawei will not be able to continue you know, with its uh, agenda. At present, about 360,000 Chinese are studying in the United States, roughly a third of the total international student population. By accepting Chinese students, U.S. educational institutions have been enjoying a steady source of income. But under the pretext of national security, Washington has recently announced new restrictions on visas of certain Chinese graduate students over unwarranted espionage suspicions. How has the interaction between students from both countries been influenced by geopolitics? Should it be? Let's hear what Professor Allison has it to say. When we have a relationship apparently falling down as fast as it has been over the past few weeks, how, for example, as an educator, are you looking at this very critical link between the two peoples? Let's just say education. Make the students stay where they are. They can come back and forth as they want, and they can learn things. They decide where they want their home to be eventually, but give them the space. I think the people to people, and let's just do the student to student part mm -hmm. that you focused on, uh, is a big part of the hope of how uh, uh, different countries with different political systems and different ambitions can nonetheless somehow survive together. Uh, mm -hmm. We go back to this rivalry partner uh, thing. So even if you take a family, in a family, we're all members of the same you know, family. But on the other hand, it can be pretty stressful sometimes <laughs> with children who have a very different idea, uh, or even between a husband and wife who may have a different idea. So there can be struggle as well as union. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the, the human drama uh, that uh, every individual goes through in his own life, mm -hmm. and that individuals go through in their national life, uh, are, are enriched by uh, having the opportunity to have uh, students uh, from America studying in China and China studying in the U.S. Yes. and uh, each talking to each other. I mean, the course that I teach uh, each fall has probably, of uh, the 60 students, probably half a dozen or more are Chinese students, mm -hmm. and they add hugely to the course because when we talk about how an issue looks uh, from a national perspective, they're all able to offer their views. Mm -hmm. So I think people, people who had the opportunity to live in more than one country and culture, and who can then and who have some friends that they can think right. about. And then they're thinking, well, oh, the Chinese are doing this, the Chinese are doing that. Well, then I can think about you, or I can think about one of my students or friends. And I think, exactly. wait a minute, that's not what she's thinking. What is this caricature that I'm building? Mm. So I think the human relationships can play a very important part in helping, again, anchor uh, what can become fairly, uh, uh, fairly abstract and uh, exaggerated 
yeah. in the political rhetoric we're going to see, uh, you know, now over the next months. Right. Let me just pick one up other thing. I mean, in, in the U.S., particularly as there has been some some demonization of China, uh, Chinese Americans or Chinese students have, mm. uh, in some instances, uh, felt you know unwelcome or unwanted. You could see uh, almost uh, this. Uh, you see tones of of uh, of racism or, yes. uh, uh, or xenophobia in this behavior, and fortunately, there are very outstanding Americans like Helene Chao, who's a Chinese American, who's a member of his cabinet, mm. and she's married to another fellow named Mitchell, who's the leader of the Senate. So they went to talk to Trump, and they said, you know, uh, excuse me. Uh, what do you think about Elaine? Oh, she's wonderful. You know, you know, she's a Chinese American. Oh, yeah, okay. Like, how, how how do you think she feels, or how do you think some of her friends feel, if they think you're demonizing people for being Chinese? Oh no, I'm not a Chinese. Huh? Okay, so that helps helps everybody understand okay. that these are we're all human beings. We all have many foibles. There's American foibles and Chinese foibles. I don't know. We can make a long list of both. But uh, I think the human ties are a big part of the picture. I see. And ones that we should regard as precious. You're watching World Insight coming up on our program. Into the wild in China, the road less taken, seen through the lens of a nature and wildlife photographer from the United States. Why do these images matter? Carl Oberman with his answers right after the break. It helped inspire people to realize that, that these places need to be enjoyed and protected and preserved and valued. You're watching World Inside, I'm Tian Wei. Kyle Oberman is a Mandarin and English-speaking environmental photographer based in Chengdu, China. He's originally coming from the United States. His photography specializes in telling the human story behind conservation. These pictures highlight the work and lives of forest rangers protecting nature reserves, national parks, and well lands. All the years Oberman has stayed in China allow him to explore so much of what is unexpected, unseen, and unknown about this country. He's seen so much more than any search engine or news media can deliver. But due to the global pandemic, he's stranded at home in the U.S. and unable to continue his exploration of nature for the time being. Earlier, I caught up with him to find out more about his stories of exploring in China and his experience of social distancing at his Austin home. And now I'm joined from Austin, Texas by Kyle Oberman, the environmental and adventure photographer. Kyle, good to see you. Hello, How are hello. you? Yeah, good, good I'm to waving, finally, uh, just waving. Hear, hear your voice again. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish to see you here in China, but apparently you were yeah, stranded I... inside Austin, Texas. Yeah, no hot pots, but um, I'm doing my best to, you know, <laughs> to survive. What do you mean by doing your best? Tell me more about how you spend your day, you know, as an explorer, well, you know, staying at home. <laughs> yeah, I never thought that when I was 28 I would have moved back in with my parents. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of been the situation over here. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm at my mom, my dad's house in Austin. It's where I grew up. So I have a lot of you know high school friends, but I, I don't get to see them either. So it's too bad. So every day, you know, I, I, I basically stay at home. Uh, I do work remotely. I'm catching up on a lot of video editing projects and photo editing and writing that I haven't had time to do, which is actually a, a good thing and a positive thing. You know, it's given me time to do that. And then I'm also doing some more time with my hobbies, like uh, running and reading. And now I've even done some painting, actually, some painting of uh, – maps of China as well. So, you know, just kind of stay busy and, and find unique ways to keep engaged. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I'm sure you missed 
the wilderness. I mean, you've been trying yeah, to present to the rest of the world something about China that a lot of people have never seen, the wild China. Tell me more about that. Yeah, you know, I've been in China you know, for five years, over five years now. And, you know, when I first got to China, I was blown away by the nature that I saw, both in my Chinese friend's photography and when I started hiking. And I realized that th there wasn't a narrative about, you know, Chinese natural beauty or wilderness that was being told in the United States. When in reality, um, you know, they, at least half of very, very wild, with very, very little people living in it. And, and so for me, that became a narrative that wasn't being told. And, um, you know, I made it kind of my mission to tell it and not just to, you know, uh, show people beautiful pictures, but also to help inspire people to realize that, that these places need to be enjoyed and protected and preserved and valued. Right. You know, and, and China has places at least as, as beautiful as America or Russia or Europe. You know, it has the Xinjiang, like Grand Canyon, you know, in China. Yeah. And, the, you know, Himalayas. So it's just beautiful. I have mouth watering when you talk about all of these sceneries because I've been staying in Beijing for the past four months. I can't move because of the, you know, the COVID-19. But maybe you can help us to go through some of the places you just mentioned. Let's start it from the Gongga Mountain. You told me many times about, uh, you know, where you started your wilderness exploration in China. Yeah, you know, the, uh, so the Gongga Mountain, that is the highest mountain in Sichuan. And it's on the highest mountains in the world outside of the Himalaya and the Karakoram. So it's a very, very special mountain just because it's so prominent and, uh, you know, it, it's very far away from the other big peaks of the world. And, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a special meaning for me because that was the first mountain that I hiked around in China. And when I was a student at Peking University, I skipped class to go do it. But I told my professor and she was okay with it. She, she, uh, I was lucky to get away with it, but she, she knew that my dream was to, you know, go take these photos and, ex and experience China that way, and, and she actually let me go. So I'm, I'm very indebted to her as a teacher. Why is it, you know, the wilderness? I mean, you have wilderness everywhere. Why wilderness in China that is so special to you? You had asthma the first time you came to China. Yeah. You couldn't bear with the smog. But you came back one year yeah. later, totally, uh, in a way, uh, amazed by the sceneries and also yeah. the wilderness. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I, yeah, I, you know, I did. I did get asthma from trying to run in Beijing when my I was there, you know, in my first time, and that was you know six years or so ago, seven years ago. So it was it was much worse back then. And then. I was very frustrated, you know, I was very frustrated, but that's when I came back and I did realize that there is this other side, like, like Western Sichuan or Qinghai, and then I got frustrated because I realized that, you know, I only thought that China was Beijing, and, you know, in the news, I only thought that, that China had bad air, but I realized, no, like, that, that's not, yeah. the, you know, that's not the truth, right? It, it, there is some of it, it is in some of the big cities. But as soon as you start going outside, even out, out of Beijing, into the Taihang Mountains outside of Beijing, you uh, have incredible fall colors like the Northeast United States. You have the Chinese northern leopard habitat on Hebei, the, and at the border of Beijing, there's leopards, you know. I mean, like, people don't know this, but it, it's, when you think about it, it blows your mind. Like, there are leopards outside of Beijing, you know, and, and, and that's their historical habitat so these stories i just think it's more of like storytelling justice in a way it's 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 more just trying to balance the equation of of this is also there and not only is it very beautiful but there are local chinese people protecting these places and for me that is also an incredibly valuable undertold story right you know there are locals in these villages and they're giving their lives to protect these amazing wilderness areas if we didn't have them you know, they, they have the first line of protection. Mm. Uh, the Hengduan Mountain is your favorite. You yeah. even promised yeah. me once we were having coffee <laughs> in downtown Beijing that you're going to take me to one of those, uh, you know, wonderful places in Hengduan Mountain. Tell us more about that. I want to have a, maybe a huge team following you next time. Yes, yeah. Well, you know, you're welcome to come. Uh, the Hongda Mountains, 
I think it's special for many reasons. One, it, it's a biodiversity hotspot, uh, both for China but the entire world. Um, and, and the, for example, the concentration of mammals and bird life is incredible. This is China's long time shot. They are very fast. China is the most famous in the world. It's also the only place in the world where pandas and snowbirds share the exact same habitat. So on the exact same trail, you might have a camera. In fact, in Wulong Nature Reserve, they've taken pictures of a snowbird and a panda, like in the going through the exact same spot at a different time. So it, the biodiversity is is the only you know type of it in, in, in the entire world. So that's very unique. And then uh, I think just the, the natural beauty. Of the Hongguan, you know, speaks for itself in the pictures and images. But because the natural beauty and the biodiversity, you have, I think, a really growing movement of local conservation groups and、uh, people that are that are centered around Hongguan, from the south in the Gaoligou Mountains, where there are、um, gibbons, and you know, I think 700 species to 500 species of birds,、uh, to the Giant Han National Park,、uh, which is mostly in the Hongguan Mountains. You talk about conservation. This is what you've been doing besides being a、uh, natural life explorer and also photographer. You've been trying to running mini marathon or、uh, ultra marathon, shall I say? Well, at the same time, trying to do some conservation work. How you manage to put all of these ideas together? Is it possible? Well, it's.、Uh, you know, I think it's only as possible as, as you keep on trying to do. But、yeah. I think. For me, I've always thought of as photography or conservation as、uh, its value as in not just you know how beautiful a picture is, but how it's used.、Uh, I think you can take an amazing photo, but if it's not seen or used, then I don't think it has much value in that sense. So for me, as a photographer, I'm thinking of okay, I'm taking these photos now. You know, can I just give them to the NGO? Maybe they don't have a budget、uh, to pay for the photos, but You know, how can I maybe partner with a Chinese corporation and do、uh, corporate social responsibility with them for them to support me for me to basically freely support an NGO that may not have the budget to have the video or the photography? So that's one aspect of you know opening up resources to groups that may not have them. And the ultra marathons, yeah, I, I last year I achieved the fastest known time around the ultra marathon around the Minyakonka route, which is a five-day hiking route. Thanks. Yeah, it was、uh, it was amazing. It was a five day hiking route, and I did it in、uh, a little over ten hours running. So the whole way, I was I was picking up trash. And for me, I wasn't trying to highlight you know how much trash there was. I was trying to highlight the fact that we had the ability to do something about it. You know, if if you're gonna hike it in five days with a horse team, you know, you can pick up some trash too. Because if I can run it. <laughs> And, and pick up trash and carry it on my back running in a day. You know, we can all pick up a couple pieces when we're hiking. So, and, and that was actually、uh, quite well received by a lot of locals and hikers, and it was really encouraging. It's amazing what you've been trying to do, but at the same time, in some of the articles you wrote、uh, a few years earlier, I noticed a sense of frustration in a way that why people only go there for exploration for. Appreciation of the beauty without really trying to conserve the nature, to protect the nature. You've been、yeah. asking once and again, very loudly, in fact, clearly in those articles. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, connecting the dots between communities, especially the outdoors community and the conservation community,、I、actually gave a, a TEDx in Chengdu last summer about this topic. Yes.、Um, I think you need to focus on an audience when you're talking about conservation. Focus on, you know, don't just try to talk to the masses. Focus on business people or the outdoors community, and that's that's what I'm focusing on, because we're the people who are outside the most. You know, we are enjoying the outside. It's our hobby. It's our sense of freedom. So it only makes sense to try to preserve it for the next generation, right? If we enjoy climbing、uh, glaciers, you know, on mountains or seeing them. Then, then we should be the ones leading the fight to cut down our personal, you know, carbon footprint because we want our next generation to have the same resource. We want the next generation to be able to enjoy the same campsite trash-free. You know, I think、uh, the biggest responsibility is on the people who are enjoying it, and we also have the responsibility to support 
the locals. Uh, the, the locals, they're actually, they're outside even more than we are. And I don't think we in see, the, see them or include them in our, in our outdoor community. Uh, but I think it's time that, you know, we do see them as part of our community. And, uh, you know, we, we, we support them uh, how we can, whether it's awareness or funding or safety training, etc. You should tell me more about the locals because you've been telling me stories about uh, two gentlemen you met. Um, one is in Gonga Mountain who has been spending his very small amount of uh, income on building, you know, very traditional trash uh, treatment uh, facilities. Uh, around yeah. different places in Gonga Mountain. Another is a gentleman in Hengduan Mountain who you followed in order to explore the mountain. Tell me more about them and how you interacted with them. Yeah, so uh, Pachu is the first one and, and he is a uh, native Tibetan. He's a Tibetan, so he lives in Kangding in Sichuan. Um, and, and he's actually a manager of a hostel. And yeah, so he helps, he uses part of his you know, profit from the hostel to build, um, you know, basically stone trash collection pits on the campsites around this trail. And also um, he has used his money to organize, you know, trash pickups where they actually take in horse teams uh, to, you know, collect and, and pick up the trash and horses and bring them back out to a massive, you know, 18 wheel truck uh, where they can put it in bags on, on the bed of the truck. And you know, it's it's a very inspiring story, but it's not an isolated incident. There are actually there are other um, some group of Chinese photographers from Chengdu, and they do the same thing in other parts of that area. You know, they they organize. They usually they, they guide uh, tours in that area for photographers, but sometimes they will just guide people just to take pick up trash from some of those beautiful photography sites. Uh, mountain, how about that? Rich. Because you were following a local yeah. team, right, to explore the mountain and you saw how they use their limited resources and yet in a very efficient way try to conserve the nature. Tell me more about that. Everything you tell is so fresh to me, you know, I want to hear all of this. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, hopefully you can come too, but uh, I think one of the, yeah, it's one of the most special places to me, oh, uh, there's a couple, I mean, I've been to a lot of places along the but I think one of them is in the Galigong Mountains in Yunnan, and that is the southern tip of the Hongdong Mountains. And um, there are a couple rangers there. One that's named uh, Taijer Hong. And he is about, uh, he's not 50, but he's, almost, he's approaching 50 years old. And he's been working as a forest ranger for 25 years. Uh, when he first started, I, he was making around 200 RMB per month, um, which is hard for us to imagine now. And, uh, but he has basically been doing it out of a commitment and love for his his mountains, and now I think he makes around 2,000 MMB a month, uh, which is still you know, in Beijing standards that, that that's not rent for a lot of people. Uh, but he's doing it in one of the most biodiverse areas of China, and he spends about you know 25 to 28 days a month living on the mountain with no cell phone service, you know, in a in kind of um, a constructed like wooden cabin. And every day he goes out to prevent poaching and to study the wildlife, uh, primarily being the Skywalker gibbon, which was only discovered as a new species in 2017. And he is, uh, he works with scientists from Sun Yat-sen University in, in Guangdong uh, to study uh, the gibbon um, and, and be their guide and also, you know, make sure that its livelihood is protected. So, uh, and he actually just won the award. He, last year he won the award uh, the Forest Ranger of the Year Award uh, by uh, the Paradise Foundation. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and he got it from uh, from uh, Jack Ma. Jack Ma gave him the award. <laughs> cool. Kyle, you know, I've always wondered uh, from the very beginning, what inspired you to go along this road? I mean, you are well educated. You are not like a rich kid, and uh, you can do whatever you want. Uh, you try to make a very simple living by being a nature explorer, a photographer. Uh, I don't even know how you survive now staying at home for that many months, uh, you know, uh, without doing your work. So uh, what really drives you all the time to be able to do all of this? I think it's amazing. I think it's just, I, I measure, the, I guess, my value as the impact I make, not, not the money I make. And for me, I think I'm very lucky. I think I found 
a life mission quite early on. And for me, that life mission is to both change people's perspectives about Chinese nature and wilderness, and then to do everything I can to support the locals who are who are who are protecting it because I, I don't see the locals getting the attention or the resources uh, you know that that they could use. I think two thousand RMB a month is is not enough, and I'd like to see you know more corporations, more people uh, supporting them and their work. You know, this is COVID-19. We're still in the middle of it. We don't know much about yeah. this virus. There might be coming back in the United States. The number is yeah. still rising. So uh, this gives a lot of thoughts for all of us about what kind of life we want and what's important yeah. about life. Uh, your thoughts? For me, I, on a broader term, I hope it really uh, gives people a wake-up call um, to show the power of nature, you know, and and how we need to prepare for it and respect it. Maybe that can give us a glimpse for the future that if that if we as humans work together more and you know reduce our impact on the earth, we can have a much much better future um, and, and to live harmoniously with nature. So I think that's that's my personal hope for all of this. And and then for personally for my lifestyle, I think it just shows how how short you know time is sometimes. And you know I think we have to value where we are when we are because we don't know when things will change you know i think uh uh you know not taking for granted my lifestyle you know uh, I, I won't take it for granted when i go back you know I, i'll see how special it is now because you never know when things will you know may, may turn out to make things more difficult the story of kyle overman the environmental photographer from the united states and who has his love for the great nature here in China. And that's all we have for today's edition of our program. If you'd like to see more, you can certainly search World Inside or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook accounts. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.